I am really interested in how we as structural engineers can use digital manufacture and digital technologies and bring those together with 3D printing. And I've delved then into the world of 3D printing with concrete. So let's have a look now at how we can make 3D printing concrete. Um, so first I'll go through my motivation and why we should be interested. So why should we care about 3D printing with concrete and drive this forward? And then we'll look at how to print, what can we actually use to do this? And then we'll expand on the current practices of what's being done and how we can then push this even further. And finally, we'll look at what we can do to progress it and how we can make it a viable construction material. So firstly, the motivation. Throughout history, we've had various numbers of industrial revolutions, and the first one was with the age of mechanization. And then we came into the movement of mass production, so we could quickly create objects, the same object, over and over again, very quickly and cheaply. More recently, we've been able to use electronics and IT to speed up our processes and to completely change the way we work. So we no longer do drawings by hand, for example, we do now 3D modeling. And we're moving into the age where artificial intelligence and cloud computing will completely change what we do. And in the construction industry, we then will be looking at smart construction and the integration of the design process with the construction process. We're not the first industry to look at this and to seek the benefits of 3D printing. This, this is some results that are taken from a report on the state of 3D printing, and these are respondents. And you can see that there's a very high number of people looking into consumer goods, industrial goods, healthcare, autom um, automotive industry, and mechanical equipment. Um, you might have seen that you can actually take a phone, scan your foot and send it to a company and they will print you the perfect shoe to fit your foot. Um, and you can also get a completely life-changing prosthetic limb that is adapted to your arm and fits you perfectly. And all of these industries are looking to find quick, low-cost ways of producing unique products. And that is what we also do. No one says, please make the same building more expensive um, and slower than someone else has done it. Um, we're always trying to find ways to speed up um, what we do. Now, with traditional concrete elements, we use formwork. And formwork takes time to erect and usually leads to more standard standardization of the design and also accounts for a large proportion of the costs. And if we could do away with this, as we'll see that 3D printing of concrete removes the need for formwork, then we can reduce the costs and we can save time. These are some reports from the Concrete Centre, and they show that over half of the cost of a traditional concrete element is actually formwork, time to put it up, take it down, and for the materials. And so by reducing this and removing it, not only are we changing the industry and making it more um, dynamic, we're also saving costs. So maybe this will lead to a transformation in our industry where um, construction sites will look more like a um, warehouse or m with more robots that we'll see on site. And if you think about a car factory from 50 years ago, it looks nothing like it does now with the number of robots and the machines that are working in there. So I'm going to show you some examples of why we should be doing this and why we care about it. Um, we'll look at rapid urbanization, changing our industry, and then finally form and efficiency. This is a photo that I took whilst conducting my research. And at first it looks like people on a fun road trip, um, but it's actually people's homes. And this whole street was lined up with trucks with people living in them. And it's quite astounding when you see that and you're faced with it. And this is the product of people not being able to afford homes, there not being enough affordable homes. And especially in urban centers, you need to increase the production of housing. 
In the UK, we need to increase it by 50% just to meet the current, um, current need and current demand. And if we could find a way to speed this up, we could then pr provide more affordable housing so that people didn't have to live in, in these. And then secondly, we're an industry which, although we've had leaps and bounds in health and safety over the past 40 years, we still are a, a high-risk industry. And if we could reduce the need to put people in situations where they're in danger, for example, by using robotics and automate automated processes instead, then we can change the industry from the front line and we could even print potentially in adverse weather. Um, then sec lastly, then on form and efficiency, this is a beautiful piece that has been done at the Euro University of Zurich and even though it's beautiful, it's also really efficient. So you can see the three points in the center and they've been designed to, um, the formwork has been designed to only have material where you need it. And if we could remove the amount of material we're using, then we can not only create these beautiful designs, but also have less impact with the materials that we're using. So what is, concrete printing and what is 3D printing. In my research, I took it to mean the use of digital files to create a three-dimensional object with layers of material. So very simply, that was my definition. We'll now look at how to print. So what are the processes that are being done? Um, the first one is layering, powder bed, and then the reinforcement mesh. So here you can see the three methods combined. The first one is the layering technique, and this is, if you like, the traditional method of 3D printing. Um, you might have seen this uh, with concrete. You might have seen this being um, advertised and people have printed houses with it and there've been a lot of news articles about that. Um, then the second one is the powder bed, and this is where you have a powder bed and a binder material. And then the final one is a mesh reinforcement cage, which we will come on to. So in the first method, the layering method, this is a method that was also called contour crafting. And in this one, you extrude concrete through a nozzle. And here you can see the robotic nozzle there. This would be attached to a robot and then moved around to create the designed shape. And what's key is this doesn't have formwork. So the nozzle moves around and creates the layers, and then each layer is poured one upon the next without having anything up against it. Here's an image that you can see the bond between the layers, um, and even though this is poured rapidly on top of each other, you still get this integration of the layers. Um, you can produce one meter high <coughs> by one meter wide and 30 centimeter width in about one hour at the moment. <laughs> Um, and one of the particular interesting ones about this method is that if you see here on the inside, it's got ridges, but on the outside, it's completely smooth. And with contour crafting, you can achieve this smooth layer, the same that we're used to seeing with formwork, because you have a sculptor, a sculpt, sculptor on the side of the nozzle, and this smooths out all of the layers as it builds up. I want to show you this one, which is another layering technique being done at the University of Berkeley. And here, this is actually clay being extruded, and they're forming tiles that you can see on the plate. And what I loved about this one is that you kind of have more creativity to play with the layers. And even though it's very much at the architectural stage, you can kind of see how you can get the free falls of the loops and very intricate designs, as well as those big, thick layers that we've just seen. But going back to the bigger ones, um, this is an element that was made for a wall and kind of shows you the scale that we're at now. So this is a two meter high by two meter wide wall and it was being used for a pavilion in Dubai. Um, and they were building multiple of them and they were building on site in Dubai. So they didn't have any shipping and transportation costs for that. Um, one of the other interesting things from this very high wall to this was that the same company were looking at producing sewer pit connections. So 
down underground where you have the connections, they, in the Netherlands, have them built up with brickwork. And this means when they need to take them out, it's a very long process and you have to close the road. Um, each one is individual, so it takes a long time to understand how it should be. Whereas with this, you can scan the pipes, understand what's there, print the supporting material out of concrete, and then insert it into a precast concrete element and simply open it up, remove the old one, and put it in within a matter of a day. And they estimated they would have a kind of 80% time saving because of this. For all of um, the layering methods, you have to mount the nozzle on something. Uh, with the contour crafting one, they mount it on a gantry and the nozzle moves up and down and around. Um, this means that you're kind of limited by how much area you can reach with the nozzle. Because if you think that your gantry has to be big, oh, sorry, that your gantry has to be bigger than the element you're building, then you could only build, say, a two meter high wall one-story house and then it becomes uneconomical with the gantry size. Whereas with this one, you could place the nozzle on the end and then move this around and adapt um, to the site. And then finally on the layering, I just wanted to show you this, which is a cut through a printed element, because one of the questions is about the bond between the materials. And here you can see that there's really not much difference between the concrete in one direction and the other direction where it's been layered. So secondly, onto the powder bed method. So with the powder bed method, you can use grain sizes from anything, a tiny powder to five millimeter thick gra grains. And you can use a resin that is either chemical or um, just a, a binder chemical, a binder material. Um, with this method, you layer the powder and then you place the resin or the chemical bond uh, where you want the final elements to be and then at the end you have to remove all of the excess powder material. And with this method you can produce really intricate designs. With the previous one you can only get a resolution of maybe 50 millimetres, 30 millimetres at best. But with this one because it's dependent on the grain size you can see here almost you can see the layers that have been built up very, very finely. And these have been done with a cement and polymer mix and were going to be used as planters for a green wall. So they're little pockets that you can plant in. Um, and to give you an idea of then the contrast of what we're dealing with, they were produced on this. So this is a very old 3D printer, but you can still produce amazing things and people in the architecture and structural industry are looking at how we can adapt and use really machines that aren't made for us to be able to make such amazing um, objects. And then now if we jump to the opposite side of the spectrum, this is a, a printer that is produced in Italy, in Pisa, um, and this is five meters by three meters. So the other one was 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters, and this one is huge and produ can produce very big elements. These are two examples which have used very coarse granule grains and have been bonded with a non-chemical binder. And when you touched them, they were quite crumbly, um, but with the chemical bind bonders, you can then get a really good texture um, and a very high strength material. As we said, this one and this method lends itself more to a very intricate design. And this one here is fantastic with showing you what's possible with just these small details. So then now we'll look at the reinforcement mesh. So this is one where the reinforcement and the concrete, it kind of turns the idea of 3D printing of concrete on its head. And the reinforcement mesh is the thing that is printed or robotically produced. And in this method, you produce a mesh cage and then pour concrete inside it. Um, and this acts as then the permanent formwork for the concrete. And the way this was built was that you had a robot and it brought across elements and it could bend them into the direction that you wanted so you could form quite 
curved and smooth walls, and then it would weld on the horizontal elements that you can see here. And this was done by this robot, which is taken from an old car factory. So again, it's been adapted to a method that we can use it for, but if we were to be able to be involved in that process, we could really develop machines that do what we need them and what we want them to do. Um, and this is the, the finish that you can see. So although this is at a very early stage, uh, you can see that there's potential um, here because just with this mesh, you've got this, this finish and you didn't need any formwork on it. So the researchers at Zurich University are also looking at a lot of robotic design, not just with printing and 3D printing. Um, and they were trying to find a way to get a robot to also smooth this. Unfortunately, that's not possible yet because they can't distinguish between the different textures. So it still had to be smoothed um, manually. Um, so now, now you know about the different methods, so layering, powder bed, and mesh. And to give you an idea, the different um, strengths, so compressive strengths of the layering technique can be now up to 40 MPA, and then with the powder bed, slightly less. Um, with the mesh method, it's more dependent then on the concrete that's inside the mesh. And what can we do to expand this? So you've seen where we are, kind of the potential, but all of those were discrete elements, so we need to have a way of connecting them. We also can see that there's potential for different use of materials, um, and then how can we include some tensile elements and some reinforcement? So the first one is the connections, and we have two kind of ingenious solutions from the team in Real San Fratillo in San Francisco. And they're the people that are working on this very small printer of 20 centimetres by 20 centimetres. And this one shows that they've integrated these bolt connections, and they've done that during the printing process. What that means is then you have to take the global structure and completely break it down into its tiny component parts before you start printing. Um, but it shows the potential that you can integrate then the connections in the printing design. And then this is an additional one that they've, they've done. Even though with these slots, you're given less flexibility when connecting the elements, it's still a neat solution for bringing those pieces together. With the contour crafting method, so layering, what's really important is making sure you get a good connection between the different layers. And this is just one small prototype looking at including a ledge um, integrated into the pouring nozzle and then that means you get a much bigger surface area and then a better bond between the layers. So next, looking at the materials, there's a huge number of different printers, different materials, people investigating amazing things um, and this gives us an opportunity to look at kind of some alternatives that we would never think of and to look at using more sustainable materials. The first one that I want to show, this is waste Chardonnay grapes, um, skin and seeds crushed into a powder and then used in the um, powder, be mesh, uh, powder bed material method um, and bonded then with a, chem a chemical uh, resin. Um, even though this isn't being used for a structure, it just shows that we can think outside of the box and push the boundaries on different materials. Then this piece is a one that was made with salt, so taken from the Californian Ocean and then printed to produce this element which could be used then on a facade. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at pushing the boundaries with the reinforcement. Um, so this is a key component to be able to make our concrete able to take tensile strength, um, tensile forces. And in one area in the Netherlands, they've used uh, steel wires integrated into the layers as they've been printing. And so this then confines the concrete um, in this direction. Although this is a small step, it's quite a big step for this process because it's hard to be able to integrate the reinforcement whilst actually printing the concrete as well. Um, 
unfortunately, I wasn't able to see it being done, which would have been exciting, but um, I've seen the final product. Um, then this is a really amazing solution, which was done at the university in Naples. And what they're looking at is printing concrete elements, so discrete segments, and then combining them into a beam with this steel exoskeleton. And what they did with their straight beam that they produced was they found that they could save up to 40% of the weight for the same bending stiffness just by producing this external exoskeleton um, and removing concrete where it wasn't needed. It took about 10 minutes to produce each one of the segments and then they've combined it um, with the reinforcement. And for anyone eagle-eyed among you, you might have spotted Mount Vesuvius in the curves of this beam because um, they're located in Naples, so they took their inspiration from there. Um, and then, do you remember the formwork that we looked at at the beginning? No. Um, and these amazing shapes. So there's also research being done in the same university in Zurich looking at integrating... Um, openings for post-tensioned cables, so um, opening, printing the formwork and then putting in the, the cables, post-tensioning and then pouring in the concrete and grouting up. Um, and this would lead you then to have a highly optimised post-tensioned slab that's very thin, very lightweight and saves a lot of material. So we've seen the potential, we've seen where we are, um, and we've seen that there are areas that we could focus on to reduce the cost, increase the time, and also produce beautiful and unique designs. Um, but how can we take this then to actual 3D printed construction? And what can we as structural engineers do to contribute to this? So during my discussions um, with the people that I went out and met during the research, I found that these were the five main items, so standards and having the right, um, the right system in place to make sure that building codes and standards are allowing them to progress, <laughs> collaboration with other people, proof that you can do it, clear contracts because you need to make sure when the designer becomes the builder, becomes the client, you have a very clear idea of contracts there and um, who's responsible. And then finally, a cultural shift. So looking at the standards, there are a suite of additive manufacturing standards available, but they don't cover every eventuality. As you've seen, there's a huge number of processes, materials that can be used. And one example is with these mesh structures. A similar company in the US is developing them with plastic printed reinforcement uh, mesh and they were trying to produce a building with them and there is no standard for that in the US so what they had to do was use a, another standard that's for wooden panels and convert it and then get an engineer in um, their local district to take responsibility for it and approve the design but what that means is then the design and progress of this is completely dependent on local authorities, on people taking their personal risk. And if we can contribute to this by helping to standardize but not limit it, then that is something that we should be putting into this. Then on collaboration. So this was in the, I was in the US when um, the election was taking place last year. Um, and this was um, a nice sign that was there. Um, with, in the US, there was a big, a big drive on intellectual property and making sure that you had, um, you had secured your design before sharing it with anybody. So even though within the community of the 3D printing um, people that I met, they were very enthusiastic about sharing and meeting. There's also a big, excuse me, there's also a big requirement to keep what you're doing private because there's a lot of money to be made potentially. And also it's a very dynamic industry. So your edge is your intellectual property. 
There was a case with the houses that were printed in China, so by the Win Sun Company. They were done using the same method that was developed in California um, by a professor, um, and they essentially took his method and his ideas from him after meeting with him. And so there is this idea that yes you should share but you also need to secure your research before doing that and I think from our side if we can work with universities, industry then we can maybe help to bring those links together um, and break down some of those barriers. And then on to proving that we can do it. One of the amazing things that's happening in Zurich and in Switzerland is that the university are being allowed to showcase their works in a building. So it will be the first building that has been mainly produced using digital technology manufacture. And they'll be <coughs> including in this some of the floor slabs. And this means that then this idea of is it safe, what happens in five years, we can then see that and see the developments um, and learn from that. So being able to actually do it is a big thing. And in contrast to the US, there was no way that, um, for example, this professor in California was able to print in a public space um, or have a building in a public space because there was a lot of worry about who is then responsible should something happen. Um, so this is really interesting and it'll be good to see what happens there. Then onto the cultural shift which I think is really the biggest issue in this whole thing. We need to be embracing the fact that we will then have automation on site and we might be seeing then more robotics on site. And what this means for how we design the design process and also the construction process. And as I said, I was in the US when um, President Trump became the um, president of the US. Um, and it was very interesting talking to the teams there, discussing what that means, because there was a big feeling that a lot of this was about job security and the fact that people felt that they needed to have um, yeah, secure jobs. And then the 3D printer researchers were aware that their research and their developments mean that there will then be a shift in the kind of work that is done in the construction industry. And we need to acknowledge that and be aware of how that then impacts the labor force and the people that are working in our industry with us. So before we finish, I want you to just imagine that we could print um, bridge, bridge towers. And this is not as crazy as it seems because there is research being done into this. Um, they want to be able to pr print towers that could stand up to 100 meters tall and this would completely knock loads of time off the production process. At the moment with slip forming you can achieve 4 meters a day but they're aiming to achieve 20 meters a day. Um, and beyond that, higher than this, there's a lot of research being done by NASA and the European Space Agency looking into printing on the moon. Um, so. I think this is an area where we should really push and be looking at making more efficient and more beautiful structures um, with this 3D printing of concrete. So on that, I'd like to say thank you to the Educational Trust of the Institution of Structural Engineers and to the Pylin Lee family for this award and to Arup for supporting my time um, doing this research and thank you all for listening. We were planning to have the questions and answers at the end, but I think it's probably better having questions for Victoria now while it's fresh in your mind and fresh in her mind, and we'll do the same with the, uh, with the second lecture. So. Questions from the floor, please. Gentleman at the back. Yes, on you go. Um, hi. Oh, sorry. Hi. Um, there were sorry, two quite short questions. Sorry, if, if you can see who you are. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm, I'm Ashley. I'm from the iStruct uh, 
the engineer for computational design and digital workflows. Um, hi. <laughs> um, with regards to the concrete truss, you say mm -hmm. that they removed concrete where it wasn't needed. What sort of method did they use for that? So they, uh, in terms of the analysis... Yeah, the analysis. So they did a stress analysis for the beam, a computational stress analysis, and then they looked at different ways of optimising it for displacement and for stress in the beams. So they removed material where it was low stress? Yeah, exactly. So they matu removed material where there was low... Right, in like an iterative process, presumably? Yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Gentlemen down at the front here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. That was very, very interesting. Um, my question was uh, one of scale, because I suppose formwork. Oh, sorry, my name is Ian Hunter. I'm an architectural materials researcher. And um, does the concrete have to be rapid setting? Because I imagine formwork must obviously retain the form as well as um, creating the the shape itself. So how high can you go with with three D printing uh, and other methods better than others for scale? So. It in terms of scale, the layering method is by far the best to reach what we would think of as a normal construction scale. So you saw the two meter high wall. Um, there have been some sculptural designs done that have been about uh, one and a half meters high with the powder bed method. Um, and then with the reinforcement mesh, that's very much more at the conceptual stage than the other methods. And that, again, is more like a one meter by two meter wall panel. Um, then the second question was, if you can just repeat it. I think it was one blurred question. Okay. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> so would the, the idea be that it would just be applied in phases if you wanted larger elements? Yeah, so the all the mixes are rapid rapid setting um, and that's one of the big challenges that these companies have is producing a mix that is rapid setting enough that you can add the next layer on top of it without the one beneath just collapsing and not rapid setting enough that you can then get this bond between the layers um, and that also comes in then in the construction process and what order you're then building elements in so if you've got a three meter long wall then you probably need to do this half and then go back to it um, in terms of the mix design it's all very secretive um, so i can't give you a lot of insights into what they're doing to make that happen unfortunately thank you another question in the middle and then somebody at the back. Hi, I'm Spencer Wilkinson from Evolve Consulting Engineers. Um, I know you said that the layering process, uh, the main sort of, uh, sort of um, issue is that we can't lay reinforcement very easily. Um, and I know you said there is a, a wire reinforcement on a wall in the Netherlands, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Has there been much research done into using fibrous reinforced concrete and is that something that is plan for the future or scalable if you like? So in terms of fibre reinforced concrete, they researchers that I met have looked at it and used it. The problem that they have is that the fibres clog up the nozzle, so then you can't pour the concrete. Um, there's also been research done in the UK at Loughborough with um, post inserted reinforcement and post tensioned elements into these concrete formworks. Um, so there definitely is research being done into it and maybe with different developments of materials of fibres and changes in concrete mix that mean you could have a bigger nozzle, then you could look at integrating those, definitely. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi, Victoria. Bill yeah. Davis, Eric. Um, <laughs> uh, did you get a sense when you were um, when you were talking to all these people who was at the forefront and potentially who uh, when we're going to see an impact in our line of work, which is 
civil structures and buildings, or if, if, there, if that's likely in the near future? So, the first question on who was at the forefront, all the people that I met were doing such different research, so such different topics, and because it's such a small community, then diplomatically, they're, they're all really at the forefront of what they're doing. So they, they're looking at either different materials, a different process, um, and they're all trying to push the boundaries. In terms of when we will see it, I think the research at ETH Zurich um, really is then pushing that boundary because they're then implementing it in this building. So they're actually going to have their work showcased and structurally used in a building and then they can look and develop it for the next five years. Um, so this was that slab, pre uh, 3D printed slab element and then the columns. Um, so yeah, there. Okay. Any other questions, Ian? Just to remark on that, my understanding, correct if I'm wrong, but in China they've actually been building quite a lot of single story homes using the layering method. Yes. Is that right? Yes, so this was the work that was done by the Winson factory yeah. um, and they have been producing quite a lot, there have been a lot of um, articles on the internet about their work. Unfortunately they were not responsive um, and it would have been interesting, but it was interesting meeting then um, Professor Koshnevis in California whose method they are using. Um, and in a way, what they're doing is printing and they're printing quickly, but maybe they're not utilizing the the exciting bits, if you like, of being able to do different forms and different shapes because they're very square houses. Um, but in terms of what you can do, it's amazing showcase. Uh, presumably they solve the problem of, for example, creating a hole, a window, and a wall. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as to how they're connected or how they've, in, whether they've just left a gap and then Produce the walls, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be this from our architect. Thank you very much for raising your developments. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned that uh, it will be uh, a, a case uh, of an engineer that will have to take responsibility. Mm. Uh, so this leads to a, a question around metrology and how do you measure unique parts? Did you find anything exciting in anyone working in that direction? So in terms of whether people are developing new materials or new ways to prove that materials work and therefore you can use either non-standard materials without having the specific code for them? Is that the question? Yeah, a sort of okay. m a dynamic uh, measuring because every part will be different and you can't really validate the process when it makes a unique part. Yeah, that's exactly the problems that they were having and coming up against. So people were mainly working with then local authorities and engineers to approve their specific design and not looking then at how you could come up with a method to show that materials from X, Y, Z are all okay. And that's something then I think that we, we should be doing and we should be leading um, and looking at how we do that, as I said, not prescriptively, but in a way that allows them then freedom. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, no great, great insights there. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, James Lemos, WSP. Um, you mentioned that the saving in form work could be a way that um, this, these, this method could become cost efficient. Did you get any sense what, while you were traveling about how much it costs at the moment to produce these and whether these costs are coming down to a point where they might become economical in the near future? At the moment, because everything's very much at a kind of conceptual level, I didn't have a 
big insight into the costs. A lot of the people doing the research are either at universities, so they're working on um, grants, or they're um, robotics designers, and really they're trying to push the limits of what the robots can do. Um, but as you saw from the beginning, if you remove the need for the formwork, then maybe we push up the concrete element costs by um, a little bit, but you then save on some of the labour costs there as well. Um, but yeah, it's interesting and it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. I draw this question and answer session to a close. Thank you very okay. much, Victoria. Thank there you. There may be time at the end if there are other questions that people want to ask. Cool. Thank you.